Okay, so one of the things I hope to accomplish with my Art of Fiction series is to get you to start thinking like a writer, because it's a little hard to be a writer unless you know how to think like one. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to analyze the first sentence of my novel, Me and Hepe, and in that way I can give you a sense of my own decision-making process when it comes to constructing a sentence. And hopefully you'll be able to take some of what I say here and apply it to your own writing. Okay, let's head to it. So here's the first sentence in all its glory. Every Sunday, like religion, me and Hepe would cram a gym bag full of cheap workout gear and snake over to the Y to fool away the minutes performing all kinds of acts, both speakable and un. By the way, the me here is Richie, the first person narrator of the novel. I like to do that to let the reader know immediately who's telling the story, not that that's anything unique to me. Most authors do that whenever possible, unless they have a very good reason for not doing so. And it's also just a good thing to do because it gives the reader a ground to stand on. Now they know who they're listening to. Um, admittedly, in my case, they don't know the narrator's name yet, but at least they know they're dealing with a first-person narrator. But what I really want to talk about is how I get the action going. In this case, I've chosen to start the novel in the habitual past. In other words, we're not actually watching Richie and Happy do anything. Instead, we're getting an account of what they do every Sunday. Now, the reason I chose to use the habitual to begin my novel is because I wanted to contrast what they were doing in the past with what they will be doing for the rest of the novel. In other words, I'm setting up a stable pattern of action which will very shortly be disrupted. The way I liked to think of it when I was writing was I thought of the YMCA as a kind of Garden of Eden for them, which they are then kicked out of as a result of their bad behavior, just like in the Bible. Obviously, I don't state this specifically in this sentence or anywhere else, uh, but I think you can see that that's there implicitly. For example, the phrase, like religion, you can literally pop that phrase out of the sentence and the action of the sentence doesn't change a whit. And yet there's the phrase, so why did I put it there? Well, I wanted to contrast what they were doing with religion to show that their activities are a substitute for religion. I wanted to draw attention to the fact that Richie and Happy stand outside of a, re <clears throat> outside of a religious context, yet in an ironic way, for they themselves have adopted a kind of religion or ritual by going to the Y every Sunday. This behavior, however, is recognized to be a kind of waste of time. That's what the phrase, fool away the minutes, implies. In other words, going to the Y may have some value in itself. It isn't leading to anything else, which again, is very much like the Garden of Eden, which in a certain sense sits outside of actual time. I then follow up on this irony with the way I end the sentence, with that strange phrase, both speakable and un. Here we see that some of their activities perhaps aren't the kind they would tell other people about, which is to say, their Eden is one in which they behave badly, or at least not in a way that is culturally acceptable. In other words, I've already begun to create juxtapositions between my two main characters and the world in which they live. I've implied that they are in some sense outsiders living in their own little world, their own Eden, in which they perform activities which the society at large may not approve of. Of course, as I've already alluded to in this video, that's about to explode. They are about to have to come to terms with the rest of the world. Not long after this sentence, the reader will discover that Richie and Happy are high school seniors, which is a typical moment in our lives when we start to think about the world beyond the borders of our school and our family. In other words, my beginning sentence accurately foreshadows the kind of novel to come. My sentence also does some characterization. It's pretty obvious from the diction that we aren't dealing with professors of grammar or verbal nitpickers. I hope the sentence also suggests that Richie and Happy are active and energetic. They may waste time, but they're still doing a lot with the time they waste. And of course, as I've already said, we get the sense that they are in some ways acting as they desire, and not out of a sense of duty or because someone told them to do what they're doing. In other words, they enjoy a certain level of freedom, and they're taking full advantage of that. Okay, let's discuss the verbs. Now, the first two verbs, 
Cram and Snakeover are both vivid and they detail specific actions. That can be a good way to start a novel because it gets your readers to visualize something, which means they're immediately participating in the process of making the story come to life. The next verb, to fool away, is an infinitive contained within a hidden phrase, in order to fool away the minutes. This verb thus gives reason to their actions. Granted, it's maybe not the best reason to do whatever they are doing, but it's still a reason. So now the reader knows why the characters are doing what they're doing. What I'm suggesting is, in this sentence I tell you who is acting, where they are performing their actions, and why they are doing them. Technically, the how is also answered with the final verb of the sentence, the present participle performing. How do they fool away the minutes? By performing certain acts. Thus, in a certain sense, the only question I don't really answer is what exactly they do. But of course, the reason I don't do so is because I'm using the end of the sentence to set up the rest of the paragraph, which does describe much of what they do at the why. Okay, so the question some of you may have now is, does every sentence have to do so much? Of course not. Uh, most sentences don't do a fraction of what my sentence does. But I wanted to show you what a sentence can do and how you as a writer can go about analyzing your own sentences in order to make them better. If I had chosen a sentence that does very little, then I wouldn't have been able to show you as much. Anyway, I hope this has been some help. Uh, we'll be doing more of this sort of analysis in the future, so don't worry if there are other questions about sentence writing that you might have. We'll get to them at some point. Uh, that said, if you have any pressing questions about sentences or about some other aspect of writing fiction, then feel free to put your questions in the comments below. And I'll see if I can get around to answering them. Uh, toodaloo!